Before we pray, there's a story in 2 Kings chapter 2. And the Bible tells us that this leader from Jericho went to Elisha and he said to Elisha, we have a problem. He said, this is the problem. He says, this land, it has so much potential. He says, but the water is bad. Therefore, the land is unproductive. In other words, what's flowing in is causing the land not to reach its full potential. This is Jericho. This is the place where the walls come down. In a sense, we're all Jericho. God shouted at our walls on Calvary. He said, it is finished. Our walls came down, and yet the water source wasn't good. So Elisha, he says, give me a new bowl. He says, and give me some salt. And the Bible tells us that he goes to the source, he goes to the spring, and he pours this salt, and the water was immediately purified. Now we know this wasn't any salt. This was heaven's salt. And you can't put new salt in an old bowl. He needed a new bowl to pour it into. And it was the salt that changed the source. The salt represents the Holy Spirit. The salt represents the, the, the flavor of heaven. And anything that is unproductive becomes productive when we are filled with the salt of heaven. So we're going to pray. I want you to put your hand on your heart because we're going to give God a new bowl today. He needs a new bowl. He needs us to empty out the old bowl. Father, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> make us salty. Make us salty, Lord. Fill us with the salt of heaven, with the anointing of God in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen, amen and amen. This is a crazy day. I don't know. The pulpit is going up and down. My shoe broke. And I have scotch tape on it. But I know that that means that God's about to do something amazing. In Matthew 5, 13, it's, it, this is Jesus. He's making a declaration. He says, you are, he's speaking to his disciples. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say you might be the salt of the earth. Maybe one day when you have it all together. He doesn't say that. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are my representatives on the earth. You are my influencers. You are my, uh, you, you are going to be the ones to change every circumstance that you step into. But then he says this, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? Now, salt was considered a, a treasured commodity. Greeks called it divine. The Romans used it as currency. And wherever salt was added, there was always a change. In ancient days, salt was placed on the wick of a candle to make it, uh, uh, its, its brightness increase. Salt was a healing agent. Physicians would carry it around in their medicine bag. If there was disease in the village, it was used as a disinfectant, as an antiseptic. Salt is designed to increase the potential of food to bring the flavor beyond what it would be able to do on its own. In Leviticus, all sacrifices required salt. Salt functioned as a preservative to keep the food longer. And there's no substitute for salt. There are facsimiles thereof, but there's really nothing like salt. And salt is a picture of what a life looks like when it is filled with the Holy Spirit. We are the influencers because the influencer, the salt of heaven, lives inside of us. We are valuable. We have potential to do far beyond our abilities because the power of God lives in us. Uh, uh, he's the change agent. We're the salt shaker, so to speak. We're the container 
that carries around the salt of God. We carry the medicine of God to a sin-sick world. The destination of salt is the earth. And we must shake it wherever we go. The salt must leave the salt shaker. We are to the earth what salt is to food. And we are to leave the taste of God in people's mouth. Now you do know this, it's not in my notes, but if you put too much salt, you could choke somebody. So we don't need to give somebody a litany of the book of Revelation when we meet them in the supermarket. We can basically tell them a quick synopsis about a Jesus that changes a life. So not only do we have God's favor, but we carry God's flavor. But what happens when salt loses its flavor? What happens when we lose our ability to influence? I want to tell you a true story. I was flying home. This is years ago, and I was in this very small airport, and I was starving. I'm usually always starving. So there was this, like, tiny little greasy luncheonette. It was tiny. It was greasy. It was damp. It was sticky. But I didn't care because I was starving. So I order fried eggs and French fries, very, very healthy. And I'm so hungry. The food comes. I pick up the fry. I taste it. But, of course, it's flat. So what do I do? I reach for the salt. So I pour a little salt on and I take another bite, but it still has no flavor, right? So I pour more and more salt on, but I shook it to no avail. At first, I couldn't grasp what was happening. There's never supposed to be a problem with the salt, right? Salt is the fixer, but the salt wasn't salty. Unsalty salt, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Salt is supposed to be salty. The pepper was right next to the salt, but pepper can't do what salt does. The truth is there's no substitute for salt. I had in my hand a salt shaker, a container that represented salt, but the contents didn't coincide with the container. The contents were flat and powerless to change the food. So how does salt lose its flavor? Well, I observed two things. Number one, salt, every box of salt has a used by date, has an expiration date. And if you leave it in the box too long, it becomes flat. We are given opportunities all the time to sprinkle a little salt around, just a little bit. Wherever you go, in the airport, sprinkle a little salt. The person that's serving you in the restaurant, a little salt. Teachers, a little salt. Students, a little salt. Wherever you go, we're supposed to be that age agent of change daily. But if you don't use it, you lose it. You lose the opportunity to salt. Then your salt becomes useless. I also noticed that atmosphere and climate matters. Where you put your container matters. If the, if the atmosphere or the climate is too cold, the salt becomes flat. If it's damp, it becomes clumpy. If the air isn't crisp and, and clear, the dampness will set in. And when you go to shake it out, it's all clumped up. There's... Be careful where you place your container. Be careful of climate change that dampens your faith and takes away your joy. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees, people that are critical. They have cheap chatter. You know the word yeast in the Greek. You know what yeast does. It makes bread swell up, doesn't it? It swells you up. It causes it to rise, not in a good way. 
And the word yeast in the Greek is the word zyme, and it means to incite unrest where there was none before. The only thing that contained yeast is salt. So when the cheap chatter comes, you got to be salty. When people come, religious people, the yeast of the Pharisees say, why are they doing pumpkin palooza? Halloween is the devil's day. We know it's the devil's day, but we're going to turn it into God's day. Because people that would never step into a church might come to Pumpkin Palooza and they might get some candy and they just might hear the word of God and might be sprinkled with the salt of God. Yes. Salt is the only thing that contain yeast. Be salty. And fire is the only thing that could kill yeast. Be salted and fired up. So here's the lesson I learned that day, and I want you to see how symbolic it is in our spiritual lives. Number one, although we place a major emphasis on packaging, the truth is packaging isn't nearly as important as contents. I'd rather have a plain old box of salt that delivers the goods than a fancy salt shaker that doesn't. The church at large has concentrated on the aesthetics rather than the content. There's nothing wrong with presentation as long as we have his presence. The presentation should only enhance the presence, never overshadow it. Otherwise, we have stage fire and strange fire. This is not show business. This is God's business. When we concentrate on the presentation, we idolize pastors. We idolize worship leaders. But people are supposed to leave the house of the Lord saying, didn't our hearts burn within us? Didn't you sense his presence? The Lord is in that house. The Lord is in that place. I've told this story uh, before. I don't know if you heard it. I was invited twice to Hawaii to do a conference. The church name is Inspired Church, and the conference is called Arise Conference. I was invited in 2020, right before the shutdown, and in 2023. Now, this conference is so massive. Uh, in 2023, I believe it was their 12th women's conference. It's so massive that they have to do a Monday to Wednesday, and then a Wednesday to, uh, to uh, Thursday, Friday. Right, no, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So they literally have to repeat the same conference because there's no room. And you've never seen anything like this conference. They have, well, the time I went, they had these ropes in the middle with like a swing. And people were on the platform, on the swing, uh, looking one way and the other way and singing. But they didn't just have the people on the swing singing. They had extended platform, and they probably had about 16 singers. Amazing. There were big-name speakers and, um, and incredible. But you left saying, wow, what a, what a conference. Wow, look at that. Wow, look at that. Honestly, um, didn't really remember being cut to the heart. So when I went in 2023, Pastor Lisa Kai, she gets up and she says these words, boy, I admire her. I mean, this is live stream. These are thousands and thousands of people watching this conference. And she says, you know, when I first started, the first two years when I started this conference, she says, I was dancing with the Holy Spirit. She said, I didn't want to do one thing that the Holy Spirit didn't lead me to do. She says, but then I got it. You ever know people, when they get up and preach, you say, they think they got it. They don't got it, but they think they think they got it. They got it. She said, I felt like I got it. And I left the Holy Spirit for the 
next 10 years dancing in the corner because we knew how to do it. We knew how to put the lights and the stage and the speakers. And listen, it was good. But it wasn't, it was missing that element when the Holy Spirit comes in the room. When he walks in the room, everything changes. You don't need lights. You don't need screens. You don't need anything. When God, nobody ever says, the presence of the Lord again. <laughs> nobody ever says that you like the presence of the Lord again. It's sacred. It's holy. So she gets up and she humbles herself and she tells this story and she asked me to come up and I spoke about the Holy Spirit and she gave every woman uh, an anointing oil like with a roller and everybody anointed one another. The Holy Spirit fell in that place. And we worship from nine at night till at least three in the morning. God just filled the room. God gave her the desire of her heart. Why? Because she wasn't trying to get another method. She went back to the basics. She went back to the salt and she knew it was. He had to pour out his spirit. Number two, I learned if something is dull, flat and stale, adding more of it doesn't change the equation. We've got to empty our containers. We've got to pour ourselves totally out, right? And ask God to fill us. We have to go to the salt mine, so to speak. Do you know how they made salt in the days of old? They would go to the, the, the um, uh, uh, Dead Sea. Uh, they would get seawater from the Dead Sea and they would pour it in the pit. And the water would evaporate, and then you had salt. See, we need to get to the salt mine. We need to get to the water of the word of God, the salt water. We need to pour it in the pit, the places that are deep, the places that seem that cannot change. And we have to allow it to stay in his presence to evaporate. Then it becomes taste to us. We taste, and we see that the Lord is good. We have to ask the salted one. To salt us, because salted Christians are irreplaceable. In just 60 AD, just 27 years after Pentecost, the church of Ephesus lost their saltiness. And they needed a wake-up call. They didn't lose their salt, and I'm going to explain that, but they lost their saltiness. Allow me to explain because language matters. There's a difference between being salted and salty. There's a difference between the indwelling and the filling. Every born again believer is salted or indwelt with the Holy Spirit the moment you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. As soon as you receive him, as soon as you admit, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, God releases the salt of heaven, the Holy Spirit. He comes inside, inside your container. You become a salt depository. The guide, the counselor, the assistant, the teacher, the convictor, the convincer lives inside of you. And now a deposit has been made in your salt shaker. Just because you believed. I'm going to give you a scripture, Galatians 3, 2. It says you received the Holy Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. If you're taking notes, just write down Ephesians 1, 13. I didn't give it because I don't want so much uh, distraction with notes. But it's basically saying the same thing. You receive the Holy Spirit because you believed. End of story. Not, you, you, didn't, you, you didn't have to pay for it. Uh, you didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to try harder to get it. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to all who believe. The indwelling isn't for a select few. It's for all believers. But there's a huge contrast between the indwelling and the filling or the infilling. Although every believer is indwelt 
with the Holy Spirit. Not every believer is filled with the Holy Spirit, full of salt or salty. Maybe you can help me, Chris. When the Bible speaks about the filling, as in Ephesians 5.18, it says instead be filled. It's speaking about a life that's completely yielded. If our container, our salt shaker is cluttered, even though there's salt in the bottom of the salt shaker, if it's filled with a whole bunch of other things, the salt didn't leave you. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us, but it's cluttered. So when you go to pour out the salt, the Holy Spirit, the salt is suffocating underneath all our stuff. The salt is compromised, mixed with things that shouldn't be in the salt shaker. A few weeks ago, I was in the prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit gave me this example. He says, this building I mean, it has the potential to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled. Change lives. Filled with miracles and signs and wonders. Filled. That's the plan. That's the plan for every church building. You want to be filled with the presence of God. We want it oozing out of the walls. But what if this building was filled with boxes? What if it was filled with boxes, 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 front to back? Ceiling to floor, side to side. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter how many plans we have for the building, we would have to remove the boxes, right? Because God could do anything, but he can't fill what's already full. What if those boxes had a name? What if those things that What if those things were on top of the salt? What if those things were on top of the salt? You know, keep those up. When we get new clothes, what do we do? We clean out our closet, don't we? Because you got to make room. You got to make room. So what do you do when you go in your closet and you go, I haven't worn this in three years. I haven't worn this in. So how about we go into our closet, our spiritual closet, and we go, I definitely don't need this grudge. This grudge is taking up a huge box. I got to get rid of that. I got to get rid of it. Throw that out. What about shame? Why is shame in my closet? He already took my shame. Why is guilt in my closet? He already took my guilt. Why is sexual immorality in my closet? He, it's making my, my closet smell dirty. I got to clean it out. The rage, the pride, the slander, the unkind words. All the complaining, the unforgiveness, the manipulation. And sometimes it's not even those things. Sometimes it's good things, but they're not God things. We were in Kentucky last week. We ministered and they told us they were putting us in a lake house. But it was a lake room. It was a lake room, small r. It was this little room. And you know, it had it had you know had coffee, everything. But the thing you, the sink you washed, the coffee cup was the same sink you washed your face. 
and uh, and they had I mean they meant well but there were plaques there was a plaque about everything it was cluttered there were nets on the wall there were oars on the wall there were candles they were everywhere but there were no drawers there were no drawers to put our clothes there was no drawers for the necessities see the spirit filled must be spirit ruled it's imperative that we are filled up that all of those boxes leave leave the boxes up Ephesians 5 14 to 18 he says wake up O sleeper why does he say wake up O sleeper because if you read Ephesians 4 through 5, the Ephesians had a lot of boxes. Woo! They were filled with boxes. They had bad attitudes. They had temper tantrums. They had anger. They had unkind words. They had pride. They had profanity. And by the way, any Christian, I don't care how big they are and they have 10 million followers, if they tell you it's okay to curse, it's not. End of story. Stop believing things that are not in the word go into the salt mine yourself and God's word will not change heaven and earth will pass away the people that are lying will pass away the people that say it's okay sexual immorality is okay selfishness is okay it's not okay Jesus died for that they were filled they weren't living up to their potential. Did God love them? Yes. He says, wake up, O sleeper. He could have said, forget about you, O Ephesians. But he doesn't. He says, wake up. Wake up. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Then he goes on to say, be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. But understand what the Lord's will is. So Paul is saying it's possible to be a believer it's possible to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and be in a comatose state. It's possible to be a believer and just go through the motions. And then he says, do not get drunk on wine. He's not saying you can't drink a glass of wine. He says, don't get drunk on wine. But what he's really saying is don't get drunk on reckless living, on earthly substitutions, on cheap imitations, on temporary fixes. He says, instead, there's a better way. Instead, if you read from the Passion Translation, I could not believe this, but between Ephesians 4 and 5, there are six insteads. Instead, there's a choice. Watch your choices. Your choices matter. Every choice you make matters. Every choice you make has a domino effect, whether it's good or bad. Instead, be filled literally means keep on being filled. Keep on being filled. You sprinkle it out, he pours it back in. You sprinkle it out, he pours it back in. And that word filled means be dominated by, be controlled by, be under the influence of, be under the government of. In other words, be spiritually intoxicated. Listen, a drunk doesn't get drunk by looking at an advertisement for liquor, does he? He gets drunk by drinking. And what happens when they drink? They walk different, they talk different, they think different, they see differently. See, the spirit filled doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a monopoly on them. We constantly hear, God, I want more of you. No, that's not the prayer. God wants more of you. Amen. Amen. Not more of him. He wants more of you. He wants those things. There you are. I'm going to go to basics. I want to end with this. I want to show you what a spirit-filled life looks like. You never heard of her. She doesn't lead a ministry. She doesn't go out to preach. She never wrote a book. And she's not cool by the world's standards. Her husband left her when she got sick. She's in a wheelchair. She's twisted. 
She's contorted from MS. She's paralyzed, yet she is the most freest woman alive. She saw me on a Christian TV show in Ottawa, Canada, uh, 100 Huntley Street. It's like the 700 Club of America. And she called Penny and she said, do you think that Maria would come to Ottawa, Canada? It's a small little city. She says, nobody comes to Ottawa. She says, I don't think Joyce Meyer would come here, but maybe Maria would come. And then she says, would she come for 10 people? And Penny says, you know, if it's God, she'll, she'll come for 10 people, let her pray. But she was very, very persistent. So she calls the next week and she says, what about 15? Would Maria come for 15? And Penny says, well, if it's God, she'll pray, let her pray. But the next week, her name is Judy Little, coincidentally. Judy Little with great faith. She says, what about 20? Would, would Maria come for 20? And I told Penny, just tell her, yeah, I'll definitely come. <laughs> now, I don't know anything about Judy Little. I don't know that she's a fairly new believer. I couldn't look her up. She didn't have a website. She didn't have social media. I didn't know that she had MS. I didn't know she was paralyzed. I didn't know she was abandoned. I didn't know she was in a wheelchair. I didn't know that the Holy Spirit prompts her to call every radio station in Ottawa, Canada, secular and Christian, to get free airtime. I don't know that Judy Little, prompted by the Holy Spirit, sends a link of the TV show to every church in Ottawa, Canada. She sends it to the Presbyterians. She sends it to the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, the Catholics, the Assembly of God, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Church of God, the Church of God in Christ, the First, Second, and Third Baptists, the Pentecostals, the non-denominationals. And the response was so huge. But we don't know that, do we, Penny? We don't know that. We pull up to this reception hall. Judy Little had to rent a reception hall because a thousand people showed up. Judy Little did not have a band. She had a son who was not saved. She taught him amazing grace. And he played amazing grace and hundreds of hands went up. Now, she's the hero. Now, Judy could have been filled with bitterness. She could have had a closet full of self-pity, rage, unforgiveness, fear, worry, shame, guilt, failure, low self-esteem. She could have been drunk with hate, slander, profanity, anger, complaining, vengeance, resentment, self-hatred, cursing the day she was born. But instead, somehow Judy Little emptied herself of all the clutter, of all the disappointment, of all the blame, all the shame. And she allowed the salted one to fill her with grace and courage and revelation, wisdom, because she made room for him. I'll tell you, whatever I'm holding on to is not worth the space it's taken up. We want a revival. We can't make a revival happen, but we could get ready for a revival. We could empty out the closets so that the Holy Spirit could fill us. We can't make it rain, but honey, we can get the umbrella out. So today, as the team comes to sing, I'm gonna ask you to be as bold, as humble as Judy Little. And I'm gonna ask you to get up out of your seat and we're gonna give God those boxes today. Maybe they're not those boxes, maybe they're other boxes. Maybe you have every right to hold on to those boxes, but those boxes are killing you. They're keeping you from being filled up. So we're gonna make room for him. The Holy Spirit isn't gonna make room. He already made room. Heaven is open to you. But today he wants 
the clutter out and he wants to fill you with fresh salt because today there's a new bowl as they sing I want you to come up and I want you to come to the front I'm going to ask you to be that bold and that daring because God wants to do something amazing in this house in these next weeks he wants to do something so amazing